Welcome to the Living the Dream podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. achieve, achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by Dr. Kylie Burton. She is a functional medicine doctor that specializes in turning normal labs into answers, hope, and healing. Dr. Kylie has a different approach when it comes to health, and she doesn't just want her patients tossed from doctor to doctor, so we're going to be talking to her about her philosophy. Dr. Burton, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Curtis, for having me. I, I love the title of your podcast. I'm a big baseball fan. So you throw in curveball. I love it. Well, I just interviewed a guy that talks about foul ball safety just before you. So I'm oh, a really? baseball fan, too. Absolutely. <laughs> well, well, besides being a baseball fan, why don't you let us know a little bit about yourself? Well, I am a mom. I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old. And I've been doing this virtual medicine practice for over two years now. So I was doing it before it was cool. And I love it. I love being able to take someone who has zero hope, who has had zero answers and transform the way that they think about their bodies, but also the way that they think about their future. And knowing that it doesn't need to just be like this. It doesn't need to be just a managed healthcare system where that's what we're trained to think. And instead we take it doesn't matter what the history is and we flip it to where they're not just surviving life, but they're thriving in life. Well, how did you start having a, dis- a different philosophy or when did you start having a dis- different philosophy on the way that you view health or the way that you do your practice? Yeah. It started, I'd say like 10 years ago. I graduated from with my bachelor's degree in nutrition. And I like this idea of food being able to help us heal. What I didn't understand was that my nutrition degree was all about the food pyramid, the food plate, RDA values, all, all that stuff that I was, I paid a lot of money for, got tossed out of the window. And I got I hired on as an assistant to a chiropractor who did a little bit of this thing called functional medicine. And at that time, I had no idea what chiropractic was, let alone functional medicine, let alone anything in the alternative world. And in fact, I remember I had like hormonal acne. And every time the time of the month came around, I had this acne pop up on my face. And so I said to the doc one one day at work, I was like, what in the heck is wrong with my hormones? And he said to me, stop drinking dairy. And at the time, that was like blasphemy because my family were dairy farmers. And what I had been taught was dairy is, has loads of calcium and we need it for strong bones. I've since thrown all that out the window and I quit drinking dairy and voila, my acne went away as well as asthma and other breathing issues. But that was the beginning of my journey for me. And then as I was an assistant for him, I had all these women coming in who were saying how they had menstrual cycle problems and libido problems and, you know, everything about that girls deal with, but that we don't want to talk to guys about. So they would all say to me, but don't tell the doctor. And it was nothing against him. I would, I would always reaffirm to them that, If they told him, he could help, but it was not my job to tell him. So eventually along the lines of that, I just decided, you know what? I have everything that I need. Why don't I just become the doctor so I can help these women and talk about female issues? So I did. I left and I went to school up in Portland, Oregon, and I was there for four years going to med school. And in that time period, I got introduced to really more functional medicine. I took a program online and while I was doing school 
And then there was a particular scenario in clinic. And when we were in clinic, you had to work underneath a clinician because we didn't have a degree at that time or our license. So we had to okay everything through a clinician. So I was okaying everything through him. Unfortunately, I had a scenario where somebody came in from the community. She was mid fifties. Every lab test was normal. MRI scans, CT scans, blood work, anything possibly that she, that she had done taken on her came back normal. And yet here she sat in my treatment room. We had to find a a blanket to cover the window because it let too much light in, turn off the lights, cover the door. So there was pretty dark in the room, but she couldn't handle any light due to the stimulation with her migraine. So I, I said to myself, if I look at people like her the same way that everybody else looks at them, I'm going to get the same results. And that's not okay with me. So that was my big breaking moment where I had to figure out what's the correct way to read these labs. We're taking these labs for a reason. They're good. We like numbers because numbers never lie. We like reports and images because they're there. They're visible. We can see them. You either see them or you don't see them. But the way that I have trained myself, and now I teach doctors how to do this, to read labs in a unique way, so where it's not just a normal lab range, but it's a smaller lab range, and I like to just say it's the ideal lab range. So we can take those normal labs and we convert them into answers, healing, and hope, it changes lives. And I can take anybody in any ugly scenario, take their medical records, blood work that they already have, blood they've already donated, the copays they've already donated, the time they've already spent, and save thousands of dollars using the labs they already have and get them the answers that they're searching for. It's, it's pretty cool. Well, what is the chronic, the cause of chronic fatigue that most doctors don't know about? What's the hidden cause of chronic fatigue? Well, there's, a, when we think about the cause, a lot of times functional medicine people will say, oh, well, we search for the cause of things. And, and it's, they're right, we do. But the problem with that terminology and that concept, even when you go into type in, you know, on Google, what causes headaches? There's more than just one cause. And for every person, it's going to be different. So chronic fatigue is the number one complaint any doctor sees, no matter what their background, naturopath, holistic doc, MD, DO, DC, whatever it is. Chronic fatigue is the number one complaint. And most often, especially mothers, mothers will get told, oh, well, it's because you're a mom. Your labs are normal. You're tired because you're a mom. Well, let's throw that out the window. And let's say, if my labs are normal, great. I want them to be normal. I always teach people, you want normal labs, because if they're not normal, then you have heart disease, kidney disease, liver disease, disease, cancer, whatever it is they want to plaster next to your name, autoimmune diseases. When they're not normal, we get a diagnosis next to our name. When they're normal, we just end up frustrated because now we don't have answers. But is a diagnosis really an answer? Like, like think about it, chronic fatigue syndrome. What does that tell you is causing your chronic fatigue? Or is it just saying, you're, you're tired. Well, no, duh, I'm tired. That's what that diagnosis is saying. Fibromyalgia is no different. Fibromyalgia, you have pain, insomnia, you can't sleep, and you're tired. But yeah, all the other labs came back normal. So let's just say you have fibromyalgia, give you Lyrica, and hope for the best. Let's manage it, right? So we have to change our mindset from thinking there's a cause to everything and learn about the causes and try to figure out what is it in you. So to answer your question, there's three specific underlying 
causes of chronic fatigue that I like to teach. And they're, the reason why it's those three is because those are the three most common. So when we're talking about chronic fatigue here, we're going to talk about three things. One is this concept known as an underlying infection. Two, everybody likes to blame the so-called adrenals and thyroid. And then the third piece of chronic fatigue is we have to look inside our cells at this lovely thing called the mitochondria. Now, flashback to high school biology. If you remember going over the cells, we, you all talked and learned about the powerhouse of the cell. And that powerhouse is called the mitochondria. Now, if I knew I would be talking about biology every day for the rest of my life, I might have paid more attention in high school, but I didn't. And that's okay. I've learned it all over again. So those are the three things, this low grade infection, number one, number two, we're going to link the adrenals and the thyroid together. And then number three is the mitochondria. And, and Curtis, I know you're thinking in all moms or even dads who are out there, men thinking, well, gosh, I have to have my three hour energy, five hour energy drink at 3 PM. If I'm going to make it through the day, or, or I get a lot of moms saying how, they're trying to read books with their kids at night and they fall asleep before the kids do. So it's a real thing. And it's not just something that we should brush off to the side. Um, fatigue is, is real life. And so let's get into this number one, right? This low grade chronic infection. Now I say that very carefully because it's not some type of infection that's going to come up in a lab test. So let's use mono, for example. Epstein-Barr virus, also known as mono. Mono is a virus. When you have an active Epstein-Barr virus test, when you actually go get tested for it and it comes back positive, you are so exhausted, you physically can't even walk up the stairs. I'm working with a couple of teenagers right now that they're falling asleep in class. They're good, smart kids, and yet, they'll fall asleep in class. So I did my reading with their blood work and I told the moms in all three of the cases, I told the moms, you know, if you were to go get an Epstein-Barr virus test, it would probably come back positive and your son or daughter would be diagnosed with mono. Now, does it really matter to Western medicine? No, because they don't know what to do with it. It's a virus. They don't know what to do with it. So they just say, oh, well, you have... Epstein-Barr virus, you know, go home and sleep for three months. Let your body find it off kind of thing. Well, they're 17 years old. They're heading into their senior year of, of high school. And sleeping in class is not an option. I mean, you can always sleep in class, but not ideal. So two of the three moms actually went to their doctors and went back, took their teenagers back and got an Epstein-Barr virus test. And sure enough, it was positive. Just Someone had to read the labs and tell them, you know, this is a possibility. So when we get to these infections, this is something low grade. It's not something that's going to come up on a infection specific test. And it's not something that you should rush to your doctor and go say, hey, I have this viral infection because they'll laugh at you and tell you to stop listening to Google. Or in this case, podcast. So are you following me, Curtis? I absolutely am. And I've never heard of that viral infection. Tell us what it is before you get to your other steps. Okay. So when we talk about a viral infection, it's really, I mean, our bodies are incredible. They're constantly fighting bacterial parasitics, parasitic infections and viral infections and fungal infections. And, and there, these things are always in us. We just need to have happy amounts of them. And I have, a, I have a podcast episode on my own podcast. It's coming out uh, in like two weeks with a doc who formulates systemic formula supplements. And these are doctor-grade supplements. He is an expert when it comes to the microbiome. And the way he explains how we're dealing, we constantly deal with these things is pretty phenomenal. So I'll just keep it simple and say, you know, we're, we, we have bacteria, varieties in us, billions of varieties. 
of bacteria. We have viruses in us. We have parasites in us. We have fungus in us. It's just a matter of keeping it all in a healthy balance. And every once in a while, these infections can become a little bit more active or versus staying dormant. So when you think about this and, and how we feel, when, when the infections, whatever they are, a virus per se, gets a little bit more active in our body, then we have our days where it's just really hard and people report, you know, I have a hard time getting out of bed. I have to take a nap to make it through my day, even though I just had nine or 10 hours of sleep. Um, so that's what we're dealing with is something that's just, I have good days where the infections are more dormant and I have bad days where they're more active. People like to call them flares. So it's like, oh, I'm experiencing a flare right now. You know, it's, it's very common with autoimmune diseases. Think about uh, the commercials you see. I literally saw one last night on MS. And every time I see them, I just roll my eyes because there's more you can do than, than take a medication. But they literally talked about those MS flares and not knowing when they're going to come and if they're going to come and how, how long it's going to come and those things like that. When in reality, I can, I can predict all of this in the, pat, in the labs. And when you see the patterns of, for say, a viral, low-grade viral infection, whether, whatever virus it is, it doesn't matter. I can't put a name to it. I just use Epstein-Barr virus test as, a, as an example because it's like the most common. And it's one of the few we actually have a test for and a pretty accurate one anyways. So that we, we're constantly dealing with these infections. It's just a matter of how active are they and how dormant are they? And are they active enough to elicit a positive test result? And if so, is the test being taken at the right time? Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Yeah. So Curtis, let me teach you how to, and all your listeners, how to read your regular blood work and determine if an infection is actually causing your chronic fatigue. It's really simple, sort of, but I'll teach it simply. The, the blood work we know as the CBC, the complete blood cell count, that's what it's called, CBC. That's the standard blood work lab test that any doctor will take no matter what the scenario. That blood test is often combined with this portion that's called a CBC with differential. What it looks like on our labs, it says CBC with diff. Okay. Now, in my opinion and with my experience, the CBC with differential is a lab test that is worth the price of gold. It is seriously that valuable when you know how to read it correctly. And remember, these aren't normal lab ranges that we're going to talk about. We're going to take that normal lab range and we're going to condense it and make it smaller into that smaller lab range. And I don't come up with these lab ranges. Um, a doctor by the name of Dr. Crossing came up with them about 20 years ago. Him and his team did a whole bunch of research. And he's one of those guys that has 9 million letters next to his name. Someone had to do the research and come up with them. So they're not mine. They're his. We, those of us who use them uh, have been using them for 20 years. So we're going to take that CBC and we're going to identify, is there an infection inside me causing chronic fatigue? And the way we do that, there's this marker on the very top of this blood panel that's called WBC, white blood cell. That's what it stands for. And that white blood cell count, if it's, write this down, less than five or greater than eight, that's the ideal range between five and eight. So if it's less than five or greater than eight, your body is fighting some type of low-grade infection. It's, it's that simple. Does that, make, does that make sense? Yep. So between five and eight, you're good. Anything higher than eight or lower than five, you got a low-grade infection. Correct. And that is the number one cause of chronic fatigue. And in fact, it's the number one cause of autoimmune disease as well. The research says that 
particularly with type 1 diabetes, some type of low-grade infection, 95% of the time is what triggers type 1 diabetes as that low-grade infection attacks the pancreas. So they're, they're starting to come out in the labs now with direct correlation and then the research with direct correlation on how these low-grade infections go undercover and under radar for so long until enough damage has been done that there then becomes a diagnosis of some way, some short sort. So that's number one of chronic fatigue, the infections. Okay. And I could, we could go into the, how do you determine which type of infection, but it gets a little dicey. So we'll just keep it simple and say, if your white blood cell count is less than five or if it's greater than eight, we got some type of infection going on that we need to take care of in order for your body to heal and for you to have the energy again. Cool. Sounds good to me. Okay. Number two is the adrenals. And I like to correlate them with the thyroid. Everybody wants to blame the thyroid for everything. And if we think about the thyroid as just one piece of a system, because it is, and we don't treat the entire system, well, that's why thyroid medication and thyroid treatment plans in general fail. And you'll get this story all the time. If this is, if this is you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Your, your doctor prescribes some type of thyroid medication, whether it be levothyroxine, synthroid, cytomel, natrothyroid, armothyroid, those are your top five. There's some type of diagnosis depending on a few of your numbers. And if you're lucky, your doctor took more thyroid blood work on you than just the marker known as TSH. We need a few more markers to determine exactly what's going on with the thyroid, but not very many people, not very many doctors order the right amount of stuff. So if you think about the thyroid as the, a piece of a system, a key piece in that system is our adrenals. And the one easy way to know how your adrenals are working, and, and when I say adrenals, they are two little teeny tiny glands that sit on top of your kidneys and your lower back. There's one on each kidney in your lower back. And those little teeny glands are responsible for producing cortisol. And cortisol is our stress hormone. So the more we're stressed, the more cortisol is being produced. And if you're like me, Curtis, you're like this, you're working a nine to five job and doing a podcast in the late at late at night. Like we're, our lives are busy. They're intense. You turn on the TV or the radio or social media, and they're telling you more crap that's going on in the world. So it's just, it's just stressful to live. So what I like to encourage people is that what if we were to eliminate the stressor on the inside of our bodies? That way we can handle the outside stressors way easier. And one of those big stressors is that infection that we were just talking about. So if you're dealing with any thyroid treatment, don't just think about treating your thyroid. Think about and figure out now that you know, do you have some type of infection? Because that infection will wreak havoc on every system of the body, any organ it feels like, including the thyroid. And 95% of Hashimoto's is triggered by a low-grade infection known as a viral infection. It's really cool. In my opinion, anyways, because I'm a nerd. So I like my numbers because numbers never lie. Speaking of the numbers and the thyroid, the TSH is the most common blood work marker. So if you're thinking, Thinking, you know, my hair's falling out. I have absolutely no energy. My feet are always cold. My brain, mm, some days it functions, some days I have no idea where it is. It goes off in left field. There's your baseball term. And, and if you're thinking this, you're absolutely correct. There's definitely a thyroid possibility. And then you go get your labs done, and your doctor says, Oh, your, your labs look great. I'll see you back in six months. 
maybe if you can convince them, they can put you on some thyroid medication. You might feel great for a week or two, and then it all goes back downhill. It's a very, very common story. So if you, if you find yourself in those shoes, you're not alone. Let's talk about the ideal range for the marker TSH, the thyroid hormone, if we even want to call it that, because the thyroid does not produce that, but that's a long time, a long story. So we're just going to use TSH. Now, on any given lab test, the normal lab range for the thyroid is 0.5 to 5.5, and that will vary a little bit depending on the lab, but that's the average normal range. And if you were to think about this, the finding your ideal TSH within that range is like finding your favorite baseball diamond somewhere between California and New York. Good luck. Now, if it's like Wrigley or you know, or that the or the green monster or the B state the B stadium is Salt Lake. That's not even major league. I wish we had a major league one here. But it's one of those that we can determine, you know, based off of location and team. But say it's like one of your favorite ballparks for kids to play at. And it's just gonna be impossible to figure out where your ideal marker is if you're given a range of between California and New York. But if you're given a range of Utah or Idaho or Oklahoma or Georgia or Florida, and you narrow it down like that. Now you can say, okay, now if I get my TSH between that little teeny range, I'm going to feel better. And that little teeny range is between 1.8 and 3. So write this down. You want your TSH to be between 1.8 and 3. Again, if it's, say, 1.1, don't go run to your doctor and tell them that you're hypo, hyperthyroid. And if it's 4.7, don't go run to them and tell them that you're hypothyroid. It, they, they'll just smile and laugh at you and tell you to get off Google and podcasting. You now know for yourself that you want your TSH to be between that range. And that's typical, typically when you feel good. How we get there, that can be a long story, but start off with the infection because that's going to be your underlying systemic problem that's probably destroying your thyroid anyways, especially if you have some type of autoimmune or if you're walking down that path. You don't need to walk down that path. You don't need to just manage your autoimmune scenarios. You can beat them and you can kick them to the curb Making sense, Curtis? It's making absolutely sense. You got a lot of good information. The listeners are really going to enjoy this and hopefully be more healthy after listening to this. Yeah, and it's a, it's a unique approach. It's a unique way. But the more, I, the more I do this with patients, the more I see how powerful it is to the point where I'm now running a mastermind for doctors I've been teaching doctors of all backgrounds, practitioners of all backgrounds now for about eight months on how to read the labs like this, because we all have them. And it's so nice to be able to say, to say to your patient, you know what, let's pull your medical records and let's see what's in there. And if we need more, we'll get more. Chances are we don't need more. Saves a functional medicine lab tests in and of themselves can be very, very pricey. There's a really great lab test for chronic fatigue specifically. Um, it, it costs around 500 bucks, but it's there. I used to run it. I don't need to run it anymore because I have this knowledge. So as far as chronic fatigue, we've covered the most common underlying source, and that's the infection. Typically, it's a viral infection with chronic fatigue. Then the second one are the adrenals and the thyroid correlation. You might have a normal thyroid lab, but it might, it's probably not ideal. And then the third and final piece is what we call the mitochondria. And if we think about the mitochondria, they're in every single cell in the body. And in high school biology, we were taught that there's one mitochondria per cell. And that's totally wrong. 
the mitochondria, their job is to take food and convert it into energy in the form of ATP in the Krebs cycle. I know all these flashbacks going back to high school biology. I know it's, it was actually important. The mitochondria though, they're responsible for producing energy inside the cell. So if we think about chronic fatigue, we think about being able to fall asleep anywhere or, you know, like the, like the kids and the teenagers falling asleep in class or the mom falling asleep, reading her kids books or just needing to take a nap or grabbing the five hour energy drink at after two or three in the afternoon. These guys got to be, you got to pay attention to these guys too. And the reason why is because the mitochondria, the more we learn about them, the more they play a key factor in, in our health in general. Every diagnosis under the sun probably has a, a form of mitochondrial deficiency attached to them in some way, shape, or form. Because if your cells are not getting the food that they need, they won't function correctly. So let's, let's go back here as I kind of jumped ahead of myself. The mitochondria, we thought, of, we thought that there was one mitochondria per cell, and that's wrong. In every single cell within the liver, they estimate that there are 5,000 mitochondria inside every single cell. Doesn't that blow your mind? Yeah, I never thought that. Um, like you say, we were always taught that that was one. Yeah. And to think that every single cell underneath the microscope somehow fits 5,000 of these inside it. So if there's that many inside our sing a single cell, they're probably kind of important. And that's just your liver cells. They estimate that in your heart cells, there's 8,000 mitochondria inside every single heart cell. Pretty crazy, but pretty cool at the same time. So that just tells us how important they are for helping our bodies convert food into energy. So there you have it. Infections, adrenals and thyroid, and mitochondria. Well, for all my female listeners out there, tell us the three steps for a woman to have a uh, good period the next time around or a better period oh so we're we're going to jump over to heavy painful periods that's what we're talking about right yep that's what we're talking about for those who have that issue and need some help on it perfect okay endometriosis is what it's called now whether you have a diagnosis of that or you don't it doesn't really matter if you feel like you are having heavy, heavy, painful periods um, where you're having to change out tampons, pads, whatever it is, multiple times a day. Or I've even been told, I've got one patient right now, um, she has lost numerous jobs over this because her pain that comes with the periods is so tremendous that she physically can't work and doesn't have enough time off to take. And the she loses her jobs. Now, flashback four months later, when I, after I started working with her, she just literally told me that she's experienced a normal period for the first time in her life. She took like one Tylenol and that was it and was able to continue on with life like nothing had happened. And it was like a whole new world to her. So when we talk about heavy, heavy, painful periods, we have to look at this hormone known as estrogen and estrogen or estrogen dominance is what it's often referred to leads to these heavy painful periods. The problem is when you go to your gynecologist, if you're in this, these shoes, this scenario, your gynecologist says, Oh, well, we can give you birth control or we can give you a hysterectomy. Which one is your choice? Well, that's a problem. Because a lot of these young want to be moms control 
if they're going to wanting to get pregnant. And if they have a hysterectomy, there's no chance of them becoming a mom. So the options are just downright pathetic. And the reason why is because they don't know, they know that high estrogen exists, but they don't know how to get it down. And that's different because if we have low estrogen or low testosterone, what do they do? They give you an estrogen cream, a testosterone pellet. So if they, if it's a low number, they know what to do to fix it. They just give you that. Now, do I agree? No, but it's out there. Estrogen, when it's high, we have to look at why does it keep getting higher and higher and higher and higher? And if you were to take birth control that has estrogen in it, which many of them do, it's going to make things worse. A lot of times women who have heavy, painful periods will report that they got on birth control and their period never stopped after that till they got off birth control. It's a rough road to play. There's hope because there's now more understanding about what causes this high estrogen level. And it's about one organ in particular, and that organ is known as our liver. Now, when our body makes estrogen, it, all the estrogen, estrogen, whether it gets used or not, when it's ready to get broken down and eliminated, it enters the liver. And if the liver is too busy dealing with other things and it never gets to breaking estrogen down and getting rid of it, the estrogen then just goes back into our bloodstream and our body continues to produce more and our estrogen levels just keep getting higher and higher and higher. The periods keep getting worse and worse and worse until at some point, whether it's happened to you or not, the term endometriosis will get tossed around. And it might not even happen until you go in at 45 years old or 38 years old for a hysterectomy. And the surgeon performing your hysterectomy will then say to you, you had a very large uterus. Pain can even be associated with this because now the uterus lining starts to grow and attach to organs surrounding it. it causes major major abdominal pains. So there's, there can be a big problem, but we have to turn our attention to the liver. And because of that, we need to lower the burden, also known as the toxic load on our liver. So the three steps I have that I recommend people, women start is one, pick three items in their house that, that they use commonly. So like lotions, shampoos or conditioners, soaps, cooking agents, just take some of those commonly used items and switch them out for a more natural product. Something that will give them less toxins. That will be a less of a load for the liver, which then can start to lower that estrogen that's going inside it. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. Less toxic, more natural or organic. Yep. yep. So that's simple. It's a simple place to start. Number two, the, the second option, once we've done that, made our, make our, made our toxic load less, we need to do some type of support. Now, there's a difference between a liver cleanse and a, and a detox. A liver cleanse is something like your juice for three days straight. You can find a whole bunch of options online, on Google, on Pinterest, on any social media platform. It's nice. It's okay. But all it's doing is relieving the burden for a few days on, on your liver as you're doing this cleanse. What I recommend is that we replenish the liver with ingredients it needs to help detoxify. So ingredients like glutathione. Glutathione is required for detox. And the problem is, is that, for example, 
a heavy metal known as mercury. Mercury will steal from your glutathione reserves, from your supply. It binds to it and steals it away from the liver. So glutathione is important. There's really only two ways to get this. Glutathione comes in supplementation, supplements. And then the other thing that gets tossed around, but I'm not going to go into, are coffee enemas. That's a popular way to produce more glutathione. So figure out a couple ways to make your load less toxic with products you use in your house. Support your liver with providing it ingredients it needs to detoxify. And then the third step is to just trust in your body and trust in its ability to produce hormones the right way, which might mean your get off birth control. And which might mean you have to stand your ground and not get a hysterectomy. Even ablations, a lot of people who hit, you know, their early 40s, even late 30s, and they're sick and tired of having a heavy, painful period. So they go in, they're not ready for a hysterectomy yet, um, but they go in for an ablation. And what that does is it like, it's supposed to basically destroy some of those cells that, that create the lining of your uterus. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't because the cells multiply and replenish and you just have more heavy, painful periods again. Um, but trusting in our bodies and trusting in our hormones specifically, it's, it's a big deal. And it takes a lot for a lot of people because for so long, their hormones have been out of whack. Like the 28 year old I'm working with, she just literally experienced for the first time a normal period. And she's been trying to get pregnant for seven years. So that's the next step is now that we got our periods normal, I can't wait for the for the phone call that tells me she's pregnant. So that'll be fun. But those, those are three easy ways to lower the estrogen levels that are dominating your hormones and causing those heavy, painful periods. Well, let's switch over and talk about your gut, about how to cure diarrhea and not regret eating certain foods for days. <laughs> You're just getting all the goodies, all the good stuff in this episode. Okay. Switching, switching gears over to gut health and specifically let's talk diarrhea constipation because it's something that so many people deal with and very few talk about it. And who wants to go into their doctors or who, what conversation around the dinner table do you have about diarrhea and constipation? You know, you don't go talking with your friends about your gut health unless it completely rules your life and it can and it does for a lot of people. I was just meeting with a girl with a mom last week. She has three young kids. I don't know how she does this, um, but her her diarrhea is so bad that if she doesn't take Imodium before she leaves the house, she will not leave the house. She has to be that close to a bathroom at all times. I had a 14-year-old boy who this is probably three years ago now. He dealt with diarrhea. He was having a bowel movement six or seven times a day. And during that time, he had to be homeschooled because you have to be by a bathroom. We did treatment for what's called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And a week after I did some manual therapy on him, he reported no joint pains. He just thought joint pains were normal. He never even told his mom about it. And now all of a sudden they're gone. So he knows that they're not normal. He, he told me, his mom was like, wait, what? You've had joint pains too? And then three months later, he's eating whatever food he wants to eat, like a normal 14-year-old boy does, and comes in and tells me, I'm constipated. And I said, well, what do you mean you're constipated? And he said, well, I only have a bowel movement one time a day. And I smiled and I said, welcome to the new normal. Yeah, I know I um, sometimes can eat food like some Popeye's chicken, real spicy. And 
you know, kind of have to take a heartburn tablet. Yeah. Yeah. Heartburn and acid reflux is another thing. Let me, we'll touch on that as soon as we, we go over the diarrhea and constipation, but this thing is this thing that causes these issues. If you go down the road of IBS and Crohn's and IBD and ulcerative colitis and, and all the, these gut diagnoses, they can typically, typically all come back to this thing called SIBO or CFO with an F. So SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, goes back to this type of infection that we were talking about earlier. This is a bacterial infection where to keep it simple, there's just too many bad guys and not enough good guys inside the gut. And depending on what type of bad guys you have, depends on what type of gas is produced. And that gas either turns into diarrhea or it turns into constipation. So we have to make sure the bad guys are gone, fix some other things, and boom, normal bowel movements. And a lot of people in the constipation world will say that they have to take magnesium every night before bed in order to have a bowel movement the next day. I just want to caution you on that because it's not a low magnesium problem. This is an underlying gut issue that should probably get treated and treated correctly. Otherwise, it can lead to some worse things down the road. Like, for example, I was at a seminar and the doctor teaching um, throughout this idea that the initial signs of Parkinson's is chronic constipation. Those are the initial signs. Now, I always think about with Parkinson's, the tremors. He's like, the tremors, those are late stage. Autoimmune diseases, particularly in this case, Parkinson's, they all go back to some type of gut issue early on. And I will confirm that with all of my autoimmune disease patients, they either have diarrhea or constipation, and we can go back clear to when they were a kid and even a teenager. I had one Parkinson's patient who um, remembers having to go to the ER as a teenager because she hadn't had a bowel movement in like two weeks. And that was common for her. So don't just brush these off to the side and say you're taking probiotics and, and magnesium for them. This is stuff that we need to resolve. It oftentimes leads down the road of two IBS, IBD, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, those type of gut issues. That's the most common effect of these things. So SIBO is what we have to tackle. And like I said, it's the bad bacteria producing the gas that then leads to either the diarrhea or the constipation, depending on what type of gas is being produced, methane or hydrogen gas to, to be specific. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Okay, then Curtis, you're wondering about acid reflux and food sensitivities. So acid reflux, I'm going to flip some nerves here because what we are told is that acid reflux is a problem of too much acid in our stomach. I'm going to challenge that thinking and tell you that it's too little acid in our stomach. I'll tell you the story of me. I was a senior in high school. I was on nine different medications my senior year. I'm 18 years old. I'm fighting. The asthma was the biggest one. So, you know, you're on two different asthma medications and then you're on another one for the side effect. And then I had heartburn so bad that for one week, I couldn't even, my esophagus was like closing up and I couldn't even swallow. I had to go in and get my throat scoped three different times. So I'm right there with you. I know the feeling taking um, what are they called? Prilosec, OC, OTC, Pepsid AC, all, all those over-the-counter PPIs is what we know them as. And if we were to reverse it, and if we were to find a supplement, the supplement I use commonly is called DS, D for digest and S for sensitive, DS that has hydrochloric acid in it, and we replenish our gut supply, specifically that hydrochloric acid in the stomach, that can actually help prevent heartburn attacks and heartburn in general, GERD is the diagnosis. 
Um, but that's, that's just a great place to start. For me, the big factor for me was I don't eat, I don't consume dairy. Dairy for me is my big culprit. Uh, gives me asthma, gives me lung problems, gives me heartburn. So I just, I just don't eat it. But removing the foods is one thing. Doing a complete gut rehab is another, which then allows you to eat those sensitive foods again. Now, for me, I do the, I've done the gut rehab, and I just, I just don't do dairy. It's, it's not worth it to me. Whereas most of the time, people will take these food sensitivity tests, and they're cutting out carrots and broccoli and spinach and all these cruciferous vegetables. You know, those type of things that are good for us, and yet we're cutting them out because the food sensitivity test kit told us to. I'm going to challenge that and say, yeah, you can cut them out temporarily, but I like food. Food should be enjoyed, not demonized, like like vegetables and these food sensitivity kits have, have done so. And these elimination diets, eliminate the culprits, but then do the gut rehab so you can eat the foods again, not have the issues with them. Well, let's talk about infertility. A lot of people face that, and that might be a good topic for you to kind of briefly go over in a nutshell for people. Yeah, infertility is very, very common. The, in fact, the numbers will tell you that one in seven couples struggle with infertility and one in four pregnancies end early in miscarriage. And you don't ever expect that to happen to you until it does. Uh, my second pregnancy actually ended at 20 weeks. My, my little, we lost my little girl at, at 20 weeks into pregnancy, sudden, unexpected. And, and you never anticipate it to happen to you and, until it does. And, and growing up, we don't grow up thinking that it's hard to get pregnant. We grow up thinking if we want to be moms, we can be moms. And yet so many people in my generation are finding themselves struggling and struggling for years to become infertile and or to become pregnant because of infertility and the options out there I mean if you look at IVF IVF can cost anywhere from 20 to fifty thousand dollars and that's just the financial toll that doesn't take to account the toll being placed on the female body going through that rigorous program. Then you have AI and IUI and all these so-called fertility treatments. I just want to caution everybody before they go into one of these. I have a hard time with so-called fertility clinics. And here's the reason why. I had a 20, this is just one example. One instance, it's happened numerous times. I had a 27-year-old that I started working with. And thank heavens, she found me before the fertility clinic convinced her to move forward because they had told her that it was going to require all of her eggs. They were going to take all of her eggs for some type of small chance to, quote, find a healthy egg that they could then use for the IVF and fertilization. Here's the problem. The daughter, well, the mom and this 27-year-old, neither one of them understood that as a female, you do not make more eggs. So they had just thought that if the fertility clinic takes all of their eggs, that she would just make more. It doesn't work like that. As, As women, we are born with the eggs we're born with. We're not making more, ever. So, like I said, thank heavens I intercepted that before it went down. And I can only imagine what fertility clinics are telling these desperate couples. It's truly heartbreaking and it makes me absolutely furious. So, when it comes to infertility, there are hope, there is hope, there are options, not just fertility clinics and fertility treatments out there. They're very rigorous, very expensive, and often 
don't quite work. The other problem why I, I have a hard time with fertility clinics is because when you see people with things like endometriosis and PCOS, the first regimen of treatment is typically Clomid. And Clomid is a pharmaceutical that's designed to force your body to ovulate and have a period. Well, with PCOS, which is probably the most common reason for infertility, it's just not understood. And if it was truly understood, like, like I understand it, where there's a two part component, not just metformin, when you truly understand what it is, you can reverse the symptoms of PCOS, balance out the hormones, and then Clomid and IVF isn't needed. Here's the other factor that you have to think about. When somebody with cysts on our ovaries, which is what is known as PCOS, they go in and they perform IVF. They get, they're so happy to get pregnant. They're, they've spent thousands and thousands of dollars, heartache, so many tears, month after month after month, they get pregnant. Six, seven, eight weeks in, they get some really ugly, bad news where that baby is now miscarried. And I see it numerous times and it breaks my heart because when you're putting a baby in, into a body that's not ready for it, chances are it's not going to end up happy. So we're forcing these fertility treatments into bodies who are not prepared for them. And then wondering why so many miscarriages happen too. So with PCOS, real quick, you have to do two things. You have to balance out the blood sugar, which is why they give metformin. But then the second component to it, they don't know what to do about because it's high again. Remember the high estrogen with endometriosis? In this case, it's high testosterone. And that's typically where women can't lose weight. Um, I, ha I have one patient who she's, she's now been pregnant and again and is actually pregnant again with twins. So I saw her after her first pregnancy. She got diagnosed with PCOS, could not drop a pound. I mean, she was eating pristine, doing CrossFit four times a week, um, and nothing was falling off. In fact, she was probably gaining weight before letting it fall off. Well, that's because of these PCOS hormones. It's nearly impossible to lose weight with PCOS. And they even start to get like the facial hair too. And that's because of the high testosterone. Now, our bodies just need to be provided with the ingredients needed to take testosterone and convert it into estrogen. Voila. Balance out the blood sugar, lower the testosterone. It might not be as simple as that, but that's a great place to start. And, and lower the PCOS symptoms, balance out the hormones so that you can regulate your period and, and have a baby. Now, the second component is what we've talked about, the most the most common cause of unexplained infertility is the infections. And we've already covered that one. So you can go back and dive into your white blood cell count and determine, is this preventing me? And do it for both male and female. Males, you're not excluded from this. In fact, the statistics say that in the last 40 years, sperm count has dropped by 60%. So 40 years ago, Say a man, a man had 60% more sperm than they do now on average. So it's twofold. Don't just blame the woman. Don't just blame the man. Make sure you're doing this together. And before you know it, we can turn motherhood a reality. So the last question is the two-part question. How do you shut down autoimmune diseases? And also, how can you get your body into a situation to where it can thrive instead of just survive? Autoimmune diseases, they're actually my favorite to work with because it's like a light bulb comes on. And 
they when they realize I don't I don't have to live like this anymore. I mean, I don't have to receive Humira injections every week or better yet, some trial injection every month that puts me on my bed for the next three days. So autoimmune diseases, real quick, I'll give you the three-step process because you already know the first step is back to that infection. I'm telling you guys, these infections, they will change. They're going to change the world. They're going to, they'll change your life. The first step with autoimmune disease is to identify the triggers. For some reason, you have to figure out why the autoimmune disease suddenly became a real thing. You hear about kids getting type 1 diabetes at 7. You hear about uh, teenagers getting rheumatoid arthritis. You hear about Parkinson's happening in the 32-year-old uh, versus a 60-year-old. Like, like, why now? Why is it all of a sudden there? And that comes back to the triggers. What triggered autoimmune disease? And in most cases, an infection is just one piece of that trigger. Other triggers can be things like food sensitivities and mold exposure and toxins and just an accumulation effect of multiple things. But the number one factor, in, and even in the research, 95% of Hashimoto's is started with a low-grade virus. 95% of type 1 diabetes is because a low-grade virus attacked the pancreas. So these infections are key. Step two, once, you've, once you have removed the triggers, now you're going to calm down the immune system. And you got to use things like vitamin D. And I go into this in great detail on several podcast episodes of my own podcast uh, beyond the diagnosis with Dr. Kylie. So if you're interested in this, you, if you have autoimmune diseases, either in your family or you're currently dealing one, with one, or you're walking down that Avenue, come jump in. Cause like, like Curtis said, you don't have to just survive this stuff. You can thrive it in it. Number two is to calm the immune system down with high doses of vitamin D. And I go into my protocol over on my podcast. This, the third step is our immune system is our gut which means we have to rebuild our gut. And those are three steps to kicking autoimmune disease to the curb. Well, go ahead and throw out some contact information. Tell us about your podcast and where people can find it. So we briefly covered a lot of things today. We went over uh, what causes chronic fatigue. We went over endometriosis and PCOS and infertility and uh, autoimmune diseases, you can get all the, the details on it and really break things down and even dive deeper into the labs inside the podcast beyond the diagnosis with Dr. Kylie. Go check it out. And I'm, I, it's my favorite part of the job is that podcast because not only do I learn so much, but I get to teach and I love to teach. Any social media links or websites where people can connect to you, any upcoming projects that they need to know about or can check out on the web? My website is currently getting rebuilt, but it should be done tomorrow. So drkylieburton.com. And I am in the process of hiring a social media expert to take over my social media. So you will soon find me on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, LinkedIn, and Twitter because they're taking it over. I don't have time for that stuff, nor am I an expert in it, but I'm ready to share the message with the world and go big. So we will soon be on all of those platforms. So look up Dr. Kylie Burton. Dr. Kylie Burton, I'd like to thank you for joining me and tell the listeners, be sure to follow, rate, review, and share after listening. This is a very important episode. Android listeners, go to the Google Play Store and download the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast app. Dr. Kylie Burton, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Curtis. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.